I don't have a title yet for the message, but my, my working title is A Response to Those Who Slept from Romans 1 to 5. <laughs> and you'll see why in a little bit. If you have been paying attention for the past year of, of sermons, you... You've learned that really and truly the means to our salvation is primarily the grace of God, but it is secured through a heart of convicted faith in that God who provides this gift. That's the way that we're saved. And Paul puts it in a number of different ways to say we are saved by faith, not by works. In fact, he goes so far as to say that if you were to be justified by your works, either 1% or 100%, then for God to consider your works in the mix, he would have to consider all of your works in the mix. In which case, a, a huge percentage of our works are bad and sinful and dark, and we would be disqualified on that basis. So Paul, at the end of chapter 3, not only are we justified by faith, but he says that works were left out of the room when that process was happening. And he uses chapter 4 to talk about how this is true of Abraham, the founder of faith. In addition to that truth, which is one that runs all the way from Romans 1 all the way through chapter 16, Paul also says something that's striking. He says that, in fact, the reason why the law came into the world, it wasn't to make people holier. It wasn't to make people more righteous. It wasn't to get people under control in one way or another. The reason why the law came was in order to increase sin. That is one of the most surprising statements in the book. But it's one we cannot run away from. For a law-bound person to read that, it's a troubling thing to know that, that what law does, in fact, is not make me more righteous, but more sinful. Now, Paul will say, is the law sin then? He will say by no means, and he's going to explain it. But he does say that the reason God put the law, which itself was righteous, into the world and put it over unrighteous people was to increase the sin problem. And then he says something that's even more striking. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, a person can hear all of these things for five chapters, which equates in, in my world to a year of preaching. He can, he can, you can hear all of that, justified by faith, not justified by works, works left out of the room, the thing law did was make me more sinful. When there was more sin, there was even more grace. So grace was always keeping up with, this, with sin, and it was keeping ahead of it. Works couldn't keep up with that. And the, there's a false conclusion that can be made. And the false conclusion is that, that, that you would put those, you'd package those things together and you would walk away thinking, well, then I guess it doesn't really matter what I do with my body or how I live my life. It doesn't really matter my, my conduct or the way I go about my business because of all of these truths, which, which would seem to make me think that those things don't matter. That is in a, a universally common and, and misguided conclusion, which we've already talked about to a degree. But there's another misguided conclusion, especially in circles that are more tightly law-bound. And here's the conclusion. The conclusion is, it's either Paul is saying that you can do whatever you want with your body, and therefore reject Paul. Or, more closer to home, Daniel or any other preaching, preacher is saying that's what Paul is saying, and they're not really understanding it, and therefore 
we're going to do away with that. So, so it, from, from the way I see it, you either adopt the heresy that says I can do whatever I want, or you assume that that heresy is being preached by the person who's preaching grace, and you run away from it. And then you end up dismissing so many of the deepest truths in the New Testament and really in all of the Bible. And it's interesting to me that Paul actually anticipates that this problem would be happening. Because he's writing to people who came out of a, of, of a world in which either being Gentiles, they did as they pleased with their body, or being Jews, they bound a whole bunch of rules over themselves. And Paul's writing to that world in which there's a mixture of these two groups, and he actually anticipates that those people, even as clear as he's been in chapters 1 to 5, would draw this false conclusion. And so at the beginning of chapter 6, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue sinning so that grace may abound? By no means, is his answer. I mean, he's, he, this message is, and I, this is the purpose, this, this message is to say, I want it to be like a flagship that basically stands to say, no matter how far we go into Romans or how deep we get into it and how much we discuss the nuances of faith and justification and a righteousness that was imputed to us by Jesus Christ, which we did not earn, that even as deep as we get into those things, I'm not saying, because Paul is not saying, that we are able to just go do whatever we want. His answer, his conclusion, anticipating a false conclusion, is are we to continue sinning because of all of these truths packaged together? And his answer is, by no means, by no means. He's saying, that's not at all what I'm saying. But, in fact, he's made that point clear all along the way. You know what's something that I've, I've had the ability to, uh, to be able to go through all of chapter 6. So I have it pretty well laid out where we're going to go in this chapter over the next several weeks. And it's humorous to me. Paul builds a, a profound case. I was telling Miranda in the car the other day that this is one of the most life-changing scriptures that I've ever been able to study. Some of the, some of the actual things Paul argues. And now, I've read Romans 6 dozens of times. Dozens of times. And it wasn't until studying it in this particular way that I've been able to actually understand the, the base and the foundation of his argument for why it's true that we should not go on sinning. And it might not be the one that we would think that he would say. But the arguments that he's going to make are, they're incredibly profound. And it's very clear between verses 1 and 14. Are we to continue in sin? By no means. And then he gives what I would think is the most Loctite argument in the world for why we ought not go on sinning. But then in verse 15, notice what he says. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He anticipates that a person, even after express and deliberate confrontation of the heresy and the false conclusion, would still misunderstood, would still misunderstand and would need again an additional argument for why that can't possibly be the case. So there's actually two giant arguments in Romans chapter 6 for why we should not continue sinning. The first one is verses 1 through 14. The second one is verses 15 through, the, uh, I think, verse 23, the end of the chapter. And we're going to be looking at those in, uh, in great detail um, over the coming weeks. So <clears throat> um, let me frame it again. There, there's an equal but an opposite heresy that you can take when it comes to the gospel. You, you either fall on the side that says, I can do whatever I want with my life, reason being the grace of God. Or you say the new covenant is like the old covenant in that it is a system of rules by which we live, reason being God does still have standards for Christians. And they're huge standards. 
So those are the two here, but and both of them. This is what I, what we need to understand. There is one of those that we would say that's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly acceptable to conceive of the latter of those two and to hold that in your mind. That we are under a system of law just as the Jews were because God does have standards for our lives. There are so many brethren that we have who would say that is an acceptable framing of, the, of Christian theology and application in the way that we go about our lives. And the thing that we need to understand is that both of them are wrong and both of them are actually equally destructive. Now we're going to see in, in great detail in chapter 6 why Paul would say that conceiving of these things in terms of law and my being justified on the basis of what I do, why that's actually a damnable offense. Not because that's directly the way a person is intending, but because that will be the outcome of perhaps a good intention in a person who's simply trying to be pleasing to God, but in the process forfeits the one means to actually being justified before God. Now, he has huge arguments for it. Now, I get the, the flavor that there are many, and this is not to say that this is what's being uh, directly taught in the pulpit, although in some places it probably is. It's not to say that this is directly the conception of leadership in churches within our fellowship and that this is how they conceive of it. But from my observation and the conversations that I have where I go and the kinds of people that I meet, there is a flavor that I get amongst members of the churches of Christ to the degree that even though they would say we are saved by the grace of God, there is a sense in which they think we are actually saved because we're the ones that do a few things right one day a week over against all of these others. And that's actually the basis of our salvation. We are the ones that do a few things right. Now, they would say, it, and, and it's, a, it's a false, it's like uh, the person who, you know, with cognitive dissonance who's holding two ideas in mind that can't be held together because they don't work alongside one another. I'm justified by grace. I'm saved by faith, not as a result of work, so that nobody can work, nobody can boast because this is a gift of God. But also, I'm saved because I am the one that is doing these things. And what happens is, a person thinking that they're saved by the things they're doing begins to build a, an, a world of self-justification. And, and what happens, ultimately, is that the, 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 the supreme standard of God, which goes all the way to the deepest place of the heart, is rendered to some really simple outward couple of things that make us feel like, I've got salvation in the bag because I did the five steps and I do the five acts of worship once a week. And that's a, just, that's a very, very dangerous way of thinking. The reason why we're, we're going at snail pace, really and truly, I, I hope everyone knows that this is out of conscience and Christian conviction because we could not understand the layering of the arguments of Paul if we went at any other pace. And because I think that this idea is so central to a potential error that we could have, which would have eternal consequences, that the most important thing in all the world that we could be doing as a fellowship is spending great amounts of time navigating through and understanding what is really being said here in this scripture. That's why we're doing what we're doing. This morning, I have two parts to, to this message. The first one is I simply want to show the, the unprecedented record of the grace of God being abused by people through the ages. And I'll, I'll show you five scriptures for that. I, I want to show that, that hearing the grace of God and misunderstanding it, and therefore because of the misunderstanding it, abusing it, is not something that's new 
This is something that has been going on all through Israel's history, and it has gone on all through church history. There are five scriptures I'm going to use to show that it's very common to hear the grace of God, even if it were to be preached in the most eloquent and accurate and nuanced and instructive and insightful and clear ways in the world and still walk away from it and miss it. Because it's a slippery thing where if you're not walking right down the center, you could fall off one side or the other. God has a standard, therefore I'm in law. God has grace for me, therefore I can do whatever I want. Neither of those are true. Grace is like a, a, a teeter-tottering along this line, which once we actually conceive of it, we'll be standing on firm ground and there won't be any teeter-totter. You won't be on a tightrope all of your life. You won't be. But when you're first learning it, it certainly feels that way. It's like a toddler stumbling along and a little bit to this side and a little bit to this side. And the Christian has to get his feet about him because of the depths of what's being preached about the gospel to then be able to walk that line confidently and grounded without wavering. So let's look at some ways that it's been abused, the grace of God, or, a, or the precedent that we see for it in the Bible. And then secondly, the second part, I want to show you three reasons why people misunderstand it. And hopefully that will clear up some confusion for why the misunderstanding is there. So first of all, Romans 2, verses 1 and following. Turn in your Bibles to that verse. Romans 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul had just accused and, con um, and condemned the Gentiles because they exchanged the glory of God for the glory of creatures. And, he, and then he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. This is the Jews. Because in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And here's the key. Or... Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, which is an encapsulation of what the grace of God is? Riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience. Do you presume on those things, not knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? In fact, when it's properly understood, it will always be led to repentance for the person who believes in it with the faith of Abraham, chapter 4. Don't you know that those things, the kindness and the grace of God, has an, has an intention and a working power to bring about repentance in your life in a way that law never could? The devil would have you to think that the way that I'm justified is by rules. And God is actually saying, if you put yourself under those kinds of laws, it will make you more sinful. The devil doesn't want you to know that. Because in fact, the thing that brings about holiness and righteousness in the life of a person, according to Romans 2 and all through chapter 6, is the grace of God. That's actually the thing that brings about holiness. But the way that it's abused is, look, I mean, there's a presuming on the riches of his kindness because they're rich, they're full, they're expansive. The idea is, in the Jew's mind, because I'm in covenant with God, then what I do doesn't so much matter. I can condemn those people for doing it, but I am a covenant person of God. This is like the Christian who's living in all kinds of sin, but says, I'm a covenant Christian. I was baptized. I go to the church of Christ. We don't use instruments. We don't have women preachers. We give every Sunday. We take the Lord's Supper every week. I'm the justified person. And there's a judgment against the sins of the world, though that person is presuming on the riches of God's kindness. God's kindness. 
because they're continuing to do in their very life the thing they would condemn in the life of another. Galatians 5.13 show you this connection between abusing the grace of God and the ways that men misuse it. Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Why did Paul give that warning? Why would, why would you follow up such a glorious promise with so grave a warning as what he said there in Galatians 5.13? You were called to freedom. Freedom from bondage to sin and corruption and chains and enslavement to sin and having sin as your master and continuing on in these ways, you were called to freedom. This is what Christ came for. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Why would he follow that up with the warning, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh? The reason why he would do it in context is because in chapter 5 and verse 1 of Galatians, he said, for freedom, Christ has set you free Therefore, do not submit again to another yoke of slavery. Like what? Like the law. Like be circumcised, which is his direct application. There was a time where God said, if you are not circumcised, you will be cut off from me. It's a little play on words. If you don't cut off this part, you will be cut off from me. There was a time where that was the absolute command of God. And now Paul is saying, do not submit again to another yoke of slavery like that. And the person would think, well then, if I'm no longer under the law, then I guess I get to do whatever I want with my body. And that's the reason why Paul says, you were called to freedom, you are free of that. But don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Your freedom actually brings about the freedom to be righteous. 1 Peter 2.16, Peter says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. There's this connection again between this freedom that's brought by the grace of God, freedom from a law that, that is, is checked against every wrong action of us and would condemn us on that basis and therefore we have to go get an animal from our barn and bring it to the priest for him to slaughter and give it to God and make us righteous for what the five seconds before we sin again it's a great freedom but but again the, don't use it as a cover up for evil Jude 4 listen to this he says for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So there in the early church, Jude is giving warning against a group who has crept in unnoticed. And the basis of their theology is that they are perverting God's grace into sensuality. A paraphrase is they were saying that God's grace gives license to you to do as you please. Sensuality, the senses. What do you feel? What do you want? What do you desire? In other words, the message of 21st century America. Do whatever you desire. And there are many Christian groups who've been affected by that message from the culture, and it has come in and, and caused them to interpret the Bible in the wrong way on this. And now you can just do what you want. Let me show you one last abuse of the grace of God. And then we'll move on to the second part. Turn back to Romans chapter 3. And now these previous four verses, Romans 2, Galatians 5, 1 Peter 2, and Jude 4. All of these are an abuse of the grace of God, which is the basic sense of the abuse is that because I have God's grace, I can therefore do as I please. That's the basis abuse. Now, I don't want to discount that that, you know, that that could, uh, I, I'm not going to say that that's not something that we would struggle with because I think that it is at, at certain points, 
Um, but we probably wouldn't say that that's the way we think of it. But there are some groups that would say it out loud. But the ne- this next warning uh, or abuse of grace is one that I think we're more likely to wrestle with. Just given the nature of our theology and our presuppositions. Romans 3 and verse 8, an opponent of Paul is hearing Paul and listens to his message. And he says to Paul, and why not do evil that more good may come? Paul says, as some people slanderously charge us with saying. Okay, do you see what's happening? Paul is preaching this message of grace, justification by faith, salvation apart from your works being considered in the process of salvation. And the person listening to Paul who's so tightly wrapped up in law and self-justification, they hear that message and they say, well, then why don't we just do more evil so that more good may come? And Paul says, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, some people hear these words that are brought by Paul and they give the slanderous charge that says that Paul is saying, do more evil so that more good may come. What does he say of those people? He says, their condemnation is just. So one of these is an abuse of the grace of God and one of them is actually a rejection of it. There are some who will outright reject the greatest gift in all of the world because in their hearts and minds, they conceive of their justification on the basis of the things they've done. And they cannot let go of that. And so they hear these messages and they say, what you're saying is actually this. And Paul says, but that's not actually what I'm saying. What I'm saying is actually this. And if you accept what I'm saying, then the outcome will be the thing that you're trying to get right now that you haven't been able to get. Namely, righteousness and righteous conduct so why is it that this thing of grace is so misused and so misunderstood three reasons the first reason and i won't spend a lot of time on any one of these but the first reason is simply the nature of the grace of god (laughs) it is really 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 good in fact it's bigger and broader and more powerful than we have ever given it credit for Probably more so than we can ever even fathom. Because none of us will ever really understand the depths of depravity in our own hearts and the height of the love of God for us despite that. The number one reason for for why grace is misused is because grace is simply that good. Chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul says, the free gift isn't like the trespass. Like, so the, the thing God gives you, which is his grace, is not the same thing as the, the, uh, the trespass that Adam gave you. And then his reason why, and we spent a lesson on this, so I'm not going to spend any real time here. He says, because if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the point is to compare the power of the grace of God over against the power of the sin of Adam and to say that God's grace is way bigger and way more powerful than that destructive sin that led everybody into uh, damnation. So, in essence, the power of God is greater than any one sin in the world. There's not a thing you could do, no matter how bad, that the grace of God isn't bigger and more powerful than it. Couple that with what he says in chapter 5 and verse 20. The law came in order to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So when you put those two passages together, you come out on the other side knowing the grace of God is bigger than any one sin and is more abundant than any and all sin. And therefore, what is it that I could possibly do that would forfeit me the grace of God? It's able to exceed all of my sins the grace of god is more abundant than all of my sins and there's no one sin no matter how bad that the grace of god can't cover those are two biblical truths and the false conclusion and the reason it's misused is because of that so that's the first misunderstanding the first reason why people misuse it the second one is we misunderstand faith um in, in most 
in most theological circles. Baptist and often Church of Christ. We misunderstand what faith is because the, the way I've seen it, there have been so many who think, even within the Church of Christ, that faith is the part of you that assents intellectually to the idea of God and works are the part of you that is the other 50% of your salvation. So you believe in God and then you have these works. Whereas the Bible speaks of them as one and the same thing. They are not two separate things. Paul said in chapter 3 and verse 28, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of law. In chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that nobody may boast. So somebody could read these scriptures carrying with them a false idea of what faith is. And they could walk away thinking, then my works don't even matter. This is a big reason, a big reason for why people abuse the grace of God. Is because grace is secured by means of faith. And faith is the means by which we get grace. And having a false idea of faith, thinking that it is merely that you believe in God or you believe Jesus died for your sins and you're willing to say, yes, give me that gift. That's why people misuse God's grace. Because they don't understand faith. That's why we spent six weeks in Romans chapter 4 looking at the life of Abraham to say, what really is a justifying faith? Do you remember? Faith doesn't merely believe in God, it believes God. Faith believes that God's way is better always. Faith believes God despite self and what it is saying. Faith is a deep inner conviction of the heart, not an outward working of the hands. Faith is fixed always on the promise of God's salvation. Faith doesn't ever lose hope. Faith is the source of true strength, not me. Faith is never critical of the way of God. Faith gives all glory to God in all things. Faith humbly receives the gospel. These things came out of Romans chapter 4. That's what faith is. And the reason why people abuse the grace of God is because they know that God's grace is secured by faith, but they don't really know what faith is. And so they misuse God's grace. And lastly, people do not understand truly the gospel. Now, you ask anybody on the street, what is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. True. Those are the particulars of the gospel. Those were the actions that were done. But understanding the gospel is far more expansive than knowing three things that were done at Calvary. It's knowing what do those things mean? What is their intention? And what will they do for me? And how do they work in my life? The gospel is far more expansive. The gospel is not just about the fact that Jesus died for your sins. The ultimate end of the gospel is that we would be in our personal lives, in our deepest hearts, made to be holy. That's the end goal of the gospel. Is that because of what was done for us at Calvary, we would actually be made to be holy. So no longer are you simply imputed the righteousness of Christ, which wasn't yours. Christ was righteous. God took his blood and put it on you and said, therefore, you are righteous. That is part of it. But ultimately, by that imputation of righteousness and God saying, now you're righteous, you don't have the law. In that freedom, I now have the ability to go carry out righteousness in my life in a way that I didn't before. And therefore, I'm made to be more holy. You cannot underline or highlight or memorize enough Romans 3.31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. Actually, we uphold it. What did he say? The faith that we have in God causes us to uphold it. That's where the gospel is bringing us. In chapter 12, right when Paul has established all of his theology... He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, on what basis? Because everything he said in these previous chapters, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God to present your bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. At the beginning of Romans and at the end of Romans, Paul says, I'm writing to bring about the obedience of faith. Obedience is the end goal. Holiness and righteousness in our lives is the end goal of the gospel. And what Paul is going to do all through chapter 6 is articulate how that's even possible. And it's going to be rich. Let's stand and sing.